morning. morning. Very well, welcome to each one of you to our worship here at Christ Church of Longboat Key, whether you're with us in the sanctuary or whether you're watching our live streaming of the service at home. We're glad to have you with us in the fellowship of God's people. And I've got to say, despite my enjoyable few weeks off, it's good to be back with you. Uh, Joan and I returned home this week to all sorts of power issues, including no internet. So if you've been waiting for days for a response from me, that's, depending on your charity, either the reason or the excuse why you haven't heard from me. But hopefully I'll get to your emails in the near future. And uh, because we're back again, Sunday School will resume. Uh, our uh, meetings are by Zoom. Uh, I hope to be able to be uh, online by about 11.15. Uh, we're beginning uh, a review and a, a working through of Eugene Peterson's book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. An announcement that on Saturday, 28 August, we are hoping to hold uh, a congregational potluck at 6 p.m. And to enable us properly to plan, we ask you, if you're hoping to come, please to sign up at the coffee uh, counter after worship is over this morning. A reminder that, as always, our elders and deacons offer a prayer ministry after the service. The vesting room at the back of the sanctuary uh, on your right-hand side uh, is available and uh, confidential ministry of prayer is offered, whether those prayers are prayers of concern for someone's needs or prayers of thanksgiving for blessings received. And the men's and women's Bible studies uh, continue this week uh, on Monday and Wednesday respectively. You have the details in your bulletins today. These are the main announcements. All the ones in the bulletin, of course, are important, and as always, we commend them to you. But we gather with deliberate purpose and intent on this, the Lord's Day. Friends, together, let us worship God. psalmist encourages us to worship. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Our God has turned our weeping into singing, our tears into songs of joy. Give glory to the God who makes things new. Healed, restored for 
trust that God delights to hear and answer prayer. Let us make confession to our God as we join together and pray. Loving and patient God, whose love gives us life, whose grace gives us faith, and in whose spirit we are given strength to live our faith, hear us as we confess our failings and shortcomings. For duties in life we have shirked, for responsibilities of faith we have evaded, for opportunities of service we have ignored, we ask for your forgiveness. And together we continue, gracious God, Lift us above the living we too readily accept and bring us to a life of faithfulness which lives with you and for you in all things. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, we trust the mercy and the grace of God. We believe the gift of God's forgiveness and the new life God makes possible. Many of our members and friends continue to support our ministry through giving at a distance, and in our worship we only uh, offer, take, certainly we only take up the offering uh, as you leave the sanctuary. But however people give, it continues to be an expression of our faith and our worship of God. And so we dedicate our offering even before, at the end of the service, we may have made one this morning. So let us pray. Thank you, loving God, for the grace you give us in Christ, for the privilege of sharing in the work of your kingdom through the life and mission of your church on earth. Bless all the giving which enables the ministry of your church here and across the world. And bless all who, by the giving of their time, their talents, and their material resources, contribute to the common good and seek to build up the positive expressions of the life that you have given. In this fraught time of difficulty and danger, bless and enrich all who seek to give service for the sake of others. Reflecting that self-giving love, we see supremely in the God of Jesus Christ our Lord, who gave himself for us, and to whose glory we seek to be committed. Amen.
Our first scripture today is 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 15. One dark day leads to many others for David. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabba. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, This is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah remain in booths. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will do no such thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. After implementing David's plan, Joab sent a messenger to David. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent to him to tell. The messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archer shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours not one and now another. Press your attack on the city and overthrow it and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. We continue with chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Perhaps as much as one year later, a sequel develops. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. 
Nathan said to David, you are the man, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, 
In Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15, he writes in verse 4, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. That's a rather neat way to think of the importance of Scripture, its instruction and its encouragement. And both are on offer. In the grubby story we read today of the stage that David's life and leadership had reached, we shouldn't need instruction on the dangers that careless, irresponsible sex produce, but apparently we do. Even before the Me Too movement, the evidence was all around us, and the catalog of pain and victimhood clear for all to see. But the story of David and Bathsheba is about more than sex. To use an old-fashioned word, it's about sin. Sexual sin, to be sure, but much more than that. The instruction the story offers us shows how sin ripples ever outward, drawing more and more people into its destructive force. It's a truly extraordinary story. We have seen, as we've been following David's story, how the Lord has led and blessed and guided and protected him through all the years from shepherd boy to uncontested king of Israel. At every step of this blessed journey, David has been quick to acknowledge the hand of God bringing him to where he now is. And he knew the responsibility entrusted to him. Way back in chapter 5, we read, And David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. David then perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. For the sake of of his people Israel. Servant leadership entrusted with authority for the sake of the people, for their security and well-being. How easily that gets overlooked and its truth forgotten as this story begins. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. Spring, kings go out to battle, but not this king. He stays home. He has others now to do the heavy lifting. He's entitled to avoid danger, stay home, enjoy some leisure. He's entitled. The people are to serve him, not the other way around. You know, when people feel entitled, they think they can get whatever they want. So when David wants a beautiful woman, he feels he can get her, even though he's told she's married. So a liaison is arranged and the affair consummated, all because he's entitled. David has become the center of his universe. It's all about him and only about him. He is utterly deceived. He thinks his actions reflect his strength his status as a powerful leader. He's wrong. 
he is diminished, cheapened, tarnished by this story. Indeed, from the time of this story on, his rule is downhill all the way. And that idea, it's all about me, I'm entitled, is a template we can apply to any number of experiences by which people today are deceived into sin. It's all about me, thinks the politician, whose double dealing is a ploy for power. It's all about me is the justification for ethical shortcuts in business. It's all about me feeds the entitlement that leads people into all manner of personal feelings which taint their own lives and the lives of others. In writing about leadership, and I'd say it applies to leadership of oneself as much as to any other leadership role, Jim Collins maintains that a good leader knows the difference between a mirror and a window. When things go well, the good leader ignores the mirror and the lure of parrying self-satisfaction and looks through the window to see the other people whose help and involvement made their contribution. It was because David forgot that that he allows sin to work its destructive force. We read a big chunk of the story today because it's remarkably well told in scripture. And as we follow the details of the story, we can see the ripples reaching other people and drawing them in. The servants who first identify Bathsheba then bring her to David. Then the messengers he sends to General Joab to bring Uriah home. Then Uriah himself, loyal, dutiful Uriah, refusing the comforts of home while colleagues are in the field only to fall victim to David's need to trick him into thinking he is the father of his wife's expected child. And then, ghastly detail this, Uriah made to carry his own death sentence back to the army. General Joab is made accomplice to the removal of an embarrassment, which is in fact the murder of a loyal soldier. And this messy cover-up that David instigates means that other soldiers too are put in harm's way and several die alongside Uriah. Collateral damage is the ghastly euphemism the generals hide behind. And in all of this notice, that what is being destroyed is David's standing as king and his ability to lead. The way he handles power does not increase his stature. It diminishes it. It diminishes him. When mission accomplished is reported to David, all Jerusalem shuddered when people heard what David said. Do not let this matter trouble you, he sent to Joab, for the sword devours now one, now another. Cynicism like that destroys the trust that leaders need to lead. And Joab, David's ruthless hatchet man, 
according to Walter Brueggemann, is given ammunition he will later use against the king when rebellion simmers in Israel and David's kingdom starts to crumble. And it all began with this one incident. It's downhill all the way from here. One shocking detail shows how David is diminished. Bathsheba carries her baby to term and a son is born. And only some time later does David's accounting begin. Alexander White puts it starkly. It cannot be overlooked that it was after a 12 month of self-deceit internal hypocrisy and self-governing silence on David's part that Nathan was sent to David in such divine indignation. How a man like David could have lived all that time soaked to the eyes in adultery and murder and not go mad is simply inconceivable. What is it in human nature that makes it hard, or in some cases makes it impossible, for people to admit their wrong and fess up to their mistakes? They made mistakes, they blew it, and they're sorry. All the corruption of innocence, all the creating of accomplices, all the death and despair that David caused flow from this one fact. He thought he was too big to say sorry. Does President Biden think he's too big? To admit that he blew it over the withdrawal from Afghanistan? Does Governor DeSantis think he's too big to admit that he's painted himself into a corner over COVID-19? What is the fault with us that we expect leaders who will always get it right. That any admission of failure or mistake is a weakness we will not excuse. Friends, it's not weakness. It's a sign of strength. It's a sign of the strength of character that faces the fundamental truth of human life. We are none of us infallible, none of us omnipotent. We are not, but God is. And here's where scripture's encouragement comes in. God sends Nathan to confront David and offer forgiveness. Now notice, this forgiveness is not some kind of get out of jail free card. Actions have consequences. Even forgiven actions have consequences. And David will live with the mess he's created and the forces he's unleashed. He, Bathsheba, grieving both husband and child, and many others in Israel, will suffer as a consequence. But forgiveness gives David the opportunity to grow. Eugene Peterson hits the nail on the head when he says, we think that if our sin is taken away, we'll become less. What happens is that we become more. More? 
Hausel. Tradition holds that David's remorse was poured into the searing honesty of Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will t teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. That psalm was set to a soaring, haunting melody in the 17th century by the Italian composer Gregorio Allegri for the choir of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Miserere Mei, it's titled. It was to be sung in Holy Week when the church faced the full enormity of the sin that put Jesus on the cross, acknowledging that when sin does its worst, God does God's best. Not to diminish the gravity or the enormity of human sin, there's a strand of Christian theology that goes by the Latin tag, O Felix Culpa. It's a full Latin sentence, the translation of which is usually given, O oh, happy fault that earned for us so great, so glorious a Redeemer. In other words, the worst that sin could do produced the best that God could do. And the church particularly remembered that in Holy Week. So that hearing again how Judas and Caiaphas and Pilate were busy doing their worst, God used their worst and made the fact of God's forgiveness real and irrefutable. What David received in personal encounter with God through Nathan was on the cross proclaimed to all the world. The Cambridge theologian Harry Williams once said, from the point of view of the Christian faith, so completely does God make all things into the instruments of goodness that we are driven to say that had there been no Judas, no Caiaphas, and no Pilate, the loss to humanity would have been irreparable. There's mystery here. There's truth too deep for words, but truth that we can live by. Yes, we fail. Yes, we fall. Yes, our faults are many and great. But God is greater still by far. And his love and his grace and his mercy ripple ever wider, creating new beginnings and untold possibilities. Let us pray. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Now our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. We are glad to be here this day, dear Lord, to open our hearts and offer all our varied feelings to you. We praise you, Creator God, whose love encircles all the earth. We praise you, Redeemer God, whose power brings life out of death and hope from despair. We bless you, sustaining God, whose spirit offers comfort and inspires the fruits of love in all God's people. Eternal God, accept the worship, praise, and dedication that we offer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We know we are richly blessed. We have faith, freedom, homes, family, friends and colleagues, ordered routines in our lives and resources to address the challenges we face. Let us not take any of these gifts for granted, but recognize the blessings that they are so that we are ready to give you thanks and praise at all times. Give us gratitude that flows in compassion and service, we pray. We pray this day for the people of Haiti, in the devastation that has befallen them, in the pain and loss they are enduring, in the suffering that continues, in the trauma of these days that will be long in healing. Be present, loving God, to comfort and to bless, to uphold and sustain. And we ask your blessing on all the efforts of the international community to respond to this disaster. We pray for the people of Afghanistan in their uncertain future. 
as we long for an end to violence and hostility, oppression and prejudice. Bring good out of this perilous situation, we pray. Raise up voices of restraint. Let power be tempered by wisdom and concern for the good of all. Be with our troops, we pray, in their fraught role of helping free the vulnerable and protecting those at risk. We also pray for wisdom for the days ahead, that a basis will be laid from which a new future may emerge that is just, secure, and ripe with promise of better days. Give us, dear God, gratitude that affirms our faith amid the mystery of suffering and pain. And give us faith to pray and to work for the advancement of your will. We include in our prayers those we know who need your love, those who are sick, grieving, anxious, or afraid, and ask that you would hold them also in the warm embrace of your eternal love. Lord, hear our prayers and lead us in your way until we come with all your children to the joys of your eternal home. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. And as we prepare to depart, we commit our way to the Lord. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and sent into our hearts the spirit of your Son. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that all people may know the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose death gives us life and whose life gives us power to live in his way. Amen.
have a great week in the Lord, everyone.